Going live, going live, going live. <laughs> We're live. We are live. It's a bit dark, isn't it? All right. Okay. Let's kick off. We Mark, are Mark, Mark has a messianic glow behind his head. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the bestseller experiment where we continue to discover what makes a best-selling novel. I'm Mark Stay and welcome to the live show, everyone. Hello. How are you today? And before we leap into this week's episode, uh, a big shout out to our wonderful sponsors at Scrivener. Scrivener is the official writing app of the bestseller experiment. It's the app that Mr. DeVoe and I used to write our best-selling Kindle book, Back to Reality, available now on Kindle. Uh, and we love it. And we love it so much. We marched into the offices at Scrivener. We kicked the door open like someone out of a 70s cop TV show. And we said, we demand that you give our listeners 20% off. We just picked a random number out the air and they said, you know, oh, fine. And they agreed. And that's that's how we negotiate with people these days. So if you go to literatureandlatte.com, put in the code bestseller XP when prompted you, dear listener and viewer today, will get 20% off. Now, who is this gentleman who's wandered into the studio with me today? Why, well, it's none other than my actual agent, my actual proper agent, What's your name again? <laughs> Ed Wilson. Welcome to the show, Ed. How are you? How are you today? George, I'm very well, thank you. I'm, I'm honoured to finally be invited <laughs> after Mark has been through everybody else in publishing. <laughs> <laughs> I've made the cut, which is good, which is good. I mean, I like to think save the best till last, or so, maybe or when we were desperate. And, desperate, you know, yes, other people <laughs> dropped out. But it's, the important thing is I'm here. Yes. And I'm happy so to be here. Richie says on the comments here, find someone who looks at you the way Ed's looking at Mark. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I haven't got my contacts Richie, in. Richie. I'm <laughs> so uh, we've got so many people with us on the live show today. Now, look, if you want to, if you're listening to this on the podcast, you know, live show, what's going on? We have these monthly live shows for our chart topper supporters over at Patreon. If you go to best, uh, Patreon forward slash bestseller experiment, uh, if you uh, sign up and become a chart topper, uh, you will get access to this and you get to ask questions. We've got loads of cool people. We've got Ink and Sage, we've got Robin Sarti, we've got Richie Unit. You knew, oh, Richie, I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Richie yeah, Unikowitz. And the uh, thing with Richie, and we might talk about this later, Richie is doing a, a daily YouTube blog. Is that right, Richie? Uh, and I've looked at the first one and I get mentioned, so I'm, de I'm definitely going to give it a plug. Who else have we got? We've got Julian Barr. Julian Barr is joining us from Australia. It's four in the morning there. He's been up with the kookaburras. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's uh, Rosemary is with us. Hello, Rosemary. Uh, Robin, we've ah, the quiet writer is here. Hello, quiet writer. How are you? Shh. Uh, I don't think I've missed anyone, but thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, so, yes, uh, we have an agent. Now, I'll tell you what, we are not going to do the usual how do you get an agent show. No, because you all know how to get an agent. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, ah, but Jutsu has joined us. Hello, sir. How are you? Good to see you. Um, yeah, we've done the How to Get an Agent yeah. show uh, twice, as far as I can recall. Um, but that said, we do have a couple of listener questions uh, that we could kick off with. Before we go to the main topic, because the main topic today is money. 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 Uh, and uh, authors' earnings uh, and all the hullabaloo around that. But um, Richard, who's with us here, uh, Richard Bat Brewster, he said, I've read several lists of questions to ask an agent, but this one is my pondering how appropriate it is. It's, it's basically, can I contact some of your current clients for references? He says, it makes mm. sense to me, but it also feels a bit too invasive, both of the agent and also the other writers. Like so many questions, I guess it's hard to give a blanket good answer, but I was curious, is this t a typical question that is that's a, it's something I've had happen a couple of times, um, and I completely understand. So what's, what's happening now is if a writer's good, then the way that they find an agent is, is rather like the way an agent sells the book. So you get lots of different agents interested, you meet them all, um, and, you, and you have to find some way of deciding. Most good agents can do a good job. Um, and, and I think that if, if you feel like you need to get some sort of corroborating evidence on why X is good at something or why they're not, then, then why not? Um, I mean, the, the authors you contact can say no. Um, the agent might get the, might get the hump because you don't trust them. Um, so it's a calculated risk, but there's nothing wrong with asking. Um, as I say, it's only happened with one author um, who is published by, uh, by Orbit, a chap called Rob Boffard. Um, and he just kind of wanted to check. He lives overseas and thought, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to a couple of the authors and just, you know, get a feel for it. I did it. Yeah? Did yeah. you? Yeah. Did yeah. you? Yeah. Who did you ask? <laughs> uh, Tom. Tom. Uh, Tom Toner. Tom Toner. Don't and, ask Tom Toner. And, uh, and John Wallace. John Wallace, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, the yeah. glowing reviews from Good. both of them. 
quite right. Yeah. That is exactly, yeah. exactly <laughs> how it should be. Because because if an agent's doing their job right, the author should live in fear, <laughs> mortal fear. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm in a lucky position because I knew they were repped by you and I, I was able to, to mm. ask them. But uh, not everyone can be in that position and they would have to maybe go through the agent, yeah. which could be all yeah. good. And I think, I think the, the issue is, the issue is, is, is you have to make sure that the agent is actually an agent. And there are some people who aren't. And there are some really basic guidelines. So uh, the Association of Authors Agents has a list of of registered agencies. Um, if they're not on there, then, then you have to ask the question, why not? Um, there are very, very limited criteria to meet that. It just means you're regulated, so you don't charge a reading fee. Um, you don't. Uh, you do, well. You you behave within the bounds of the law, and also you are you are solvent. You maintain a separation between client funds and between office funds. Really, really basic stuff, sort of anti fraud stuff. Um, and in a general sense, if an agent isn't willing to disclose details of how they work. Who they work with then you have to ask what they're hiding mm. i mean i'll tell any author anything anything <laughs> literally anything <laughs> but i do if someone's good enough then I, then you know i i'm i want to jump through hoops to make sure that i can work with them yeah and that's the reality i mean basically anyone who's in the writers and artists your book should be fairly oh anyone can pay to be in that oh really yeah I, I think i think they are pretty good uh, at vetting but you can't that is a paid for resource right. um whereas whereas the aaa you have to you've got to fulfill the criteria to be part of mm. it um, in general if any agent ever asks you for money then they're a they're a they're a bad egg and you must walk away instantly walk away but do, just do your research i mean most of the time you can get a vibe um you know there's a thing called writer beware uh, I think sci-fi writers of America have a have a list of a kind of, of people who've been naughty. So there's plenty of resources out there to work out whether the person you're dealing with is, is legit. Very good, mm -hmm. very good. Uh, Penilla, who's not with us today, but she left this on Facebook. She said, um, I did ask this of my agent, or perhaps she even offered, I forget, but she supplied an email address for a client who answered my email to her. I found it really helpful. I didn't feel I was being cheeky. It's a business partnership, and I don't think you should feel it is inappropriate to ask uh, I look forward to hearing what Ed thinks. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's cool. Excellent <laughs> stuff. Now, the main topic of the day before us is... Um, <laughs> Richie, I like money. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we like money too. Uh, you know, just enough just enough to get by. That's all we want. And and this is, a, this is a problem. Fewer and fewer authors are able to earn a living mm -hmm. these days, uh, full-time writing. And this all really kicked off with the Society of Authors uh, about a week, 10 days ago. Um, sent an open letter to the, pub, to the publishing association, essentially concerned about the decline in authors' income generally. And book sales seem to be going through the roof as yes. well, particularly e-book sales. Uh, part of the problem is, um, well, let, let's start from the top. I mean, yeah. what, I mean what, uh, essentially, the, there is, a, there is a, a, a disparity between publishers who, as PLCs, have to, have to declare their earnings, their profits, and the profits are going up and up. Um, and anecdotally, and in the reviews that the ALCS does every couple of years, um, all the earnings are going down and down, and it, it seems that that publishers' motivations are to make money for their shareholders rather than serve the, the continuance of, of the publishing trade and actually rewarding the people who are producing the books, who are kind of important. I, as <laughs> someone who works for a publisher and is an author, I'm, I'm going to play a bit of devil's advocate here um, because I know that there are people here who would say that advances are down in order for you to earn out more quickly and therefore become a profitable author yeah. because publishers if you look at the profit and loss of any publisher the thing that hammers them all the time are the massive advances yeah. set against their profits and i you know i've been with orion for 15 years and orion is a very different company to the one when i joined when i joined there's, there was a culture of, of boasting about how much they paid for advances mm. and, you know, the bigger the better. And, and, of course, if those books didn't work, you had to write that off. Yeah, and it was yeah, a massive, massive loss. So there's a very different mentality here. Which and, and those authors, if you were one of those authors, you got a massive advance and the book died for mm. whatever reason. That was it. Yeah. The game over. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, you have it. to come back hat in hand and get that small advance. Well, and, or and I think the, the way that the way that agents work is we. I mean, we are we are paid on commission, so we we have no other way of earning apart from taking commission on the the advances that we generate for our authors. So obviously, there is a certain motivation to try and get as much money as possible. But I think 
particularly a younger generation of agents are more about sustainability and, and knowing that if you start with a relatively low advance and then build that way then you actually end up with an author with a career rather than somebody who gets one big kind of paycheck and then that's it um no i'm not going to bash the publishers at all because i mean publishers are wonderful we, they're, they're who we deal with the entire time but the reality is that that over the last decade there have been many consolidations publishers have merged great big groups have come together and what those have done is created savings at the back end of logistics um, yes. and those have not necessarily been passed on to the author and investment in the authors and i think publishers are trying to find a way of doing it in a way that's going to help everybody Yes, I wonder where the money's going. He said, sitting in a six-story building that's only a few years old, full yes. of it's tr- high-tech it's, stuff. It's, and, yeah. it's true. Publish it, pub- I mean, large corporate publishers are—they are, are not—they're not just a, a business, a mom and pop operation at a kitchen table. They are big global multinational companies, and they need big head offices. They have huge head counts. It's you know, it's it's their big business. Yeah, so I can say uh, I, I haven't had an above inflation pay rise <laughs> for about ten years now. So it's not just the authors who are getting yeah. screwed. <clears throat> Uh, probably shouldn't say that. No. Um, Julian says. Julian says I had to explain to my son that I will only get a little money from each sale of my book. He was very confused. Uh, quite right. I had to tell my dad he could not retire and let me support him in the lifestyle he has become accustomed to. Uh, and that, there is this myth that authors, yes. if you're a published author, you're a millionaire because that's what you see on the news. But those are the outliers. Those are the outliers. And, and in, in any industry, the, the the superstars who are making the huge amounts of money, it, you can usually count them on 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 one hand. I mean, as an agency we probably have maybe 350 400 clients i would say the ones who live solely off their their uh, their writing earnings probably i would say four or five if that really? yeah and that's and a lot of that's by choice so people who choose to work in in, uh, in teaching creative writing or have always been journalists or just wanted to keep their job going you know they enjoy doing it um and i don't i don't think necessarily that just living off your writing has to be the goal i think mm. people have have rounded and fulfilled lives where writing is part of it and then they do something else you know so let's um put you on the spot here a bit and break down where the money goes so if a book uh so paperback sells for 7.99 at mm-hmm. full price which in itself is an unusual uh, thing yes uh so you've got say you are supporting your local indie uh bookshop which you definitely should and you buy the book at full price how does that break down? So the so the publisher will have sold the book to the retailer at a whopping discount. And that, depending who you go through, so usually there'll be a distributor in the way. So let's say a 50% discount is pretty standard. Now, yeah. Right. So that you've already carved off half of that. Yeah. And that's the retailer's profit. They have to make their money out of that. So if there's been a distributor, some like Bertrams or Gardeners in between, then you've got their costs as well. They will shave off a percentage. Mm-hmm. So then you're basically with the publisher and the and the in-house costs. So you've got to you've got to edit the book. You've got to you've got to um, employ uh, marketing, publicity, sales staff. You've got to print the damn thing. You've got to ship the damn thing. Um, so all of those costs go, and then the author's royalty, which on a paperback will be seven and a half percent or ten percent. Mm. And of course, that that's you get slightly higher royalty for ebooks, don't yeah. you? Yeah. So ebooks. Now, this is an interesting one. This is where this is where publishing looks very very old fashioned. So when I said that the publisher <laughs> sells the book to the bookshop, the publisher doesn't sell the book to the bookshop. The publisher lends the book to the bookshop on the off chance that the bookshop sells it. And if the bookshop doesn't sell it, the bookshop they can return those books up to two years later. Uh, it's always longer than that. Depends on the depends contract. On the contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so at every stage, um, and and if you if you if you if you have a royalty rate of seven and a half percent, if the discount goes above fifty percent, then the royalty de-escalates. Um, so, in fact, it's it's there are so many permutations, and publishers' royalty statements are, are so. What, so let's let's just break that. So going back to paperback. So my paperback that's seven ninety nine is selling for say two ninety nine on mm-hmm. Amazon. They've given Amazon or any other other online retailers yes. are available. Or they've given them at least fifty percent. Yes, probably uh, closer to seventy percent. And if if, it, if if there's some kind of offer and they are giving yep. them extra discount, that eats into my royalty for each eats copy. Eats into the royalty because the standard royalty for print copies is based on the published price. For eBooks and increasingly for audio books, the the uh, the royalty is based on the net receipt, so the actual price received. Now there is an argument that that makes more sense. It's much more transparent and fewer complicated arcane sums to be done. But in general, publishers are less willing to offer higher net receipts royalties than they than they have traditionally offered published 
published price. And it's and it's bizarre because it's always been that way and nobody really questions it. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the reality of having a royalty based on a selling price that isn't fixed is a is a hangover from the from the net book agreement, which is a whole other podcast, yeah. which you can look up on look up on Wikipedia. And is and is you know essentially was price fixing on books and persisted until the 1990s. And that's that the reality is that the, the hangover of that is what still casts a hangover cast a shadow. Does a hangover cast the a mixing shadow? Mixing image yeah. first. Hang <laughs> the, the hangover from that persists in publishing. Um, and and increasingly new publishers will set up on a net receipts model. So that means that that you have a royalty based on the actual price that, that the publisher is making per book, mm. which is much more transparent, much easier to deal with. And so ebooks, you're maybe getting 25%? 25% from a big, yeah, from a big corporate house. Um, uh, ebook only publishers will often offer up to 50%. Yeah. And again, but again, if if you do that 99p offer, if you're a Kindle monthly yep. deal or whatever, or Kobo deal or whatever, then again, that eats into your... It uh, does, yeah. Account. And they still have, they still have a discount on ebooks as well. Um, you can also have ebook returns, which I find quite funny. Yes, it yeah, does happen. Yeah, yeah, it's, a weird, it's, a weird, it's a weird thing. But then again, the ebook price is sometimes set by the publisher and sometimes set by the retailer. Hmm. So if the retailer is matching another retailer, then often your royalty will be based on a full price that is never actually seen. It's all deeply, <laughs> deeply, deeply confusing. Um, and and this, is, this is what, I mean, a lot of the, lot of the things that agents add to the, to the whole process is is demystifying the kind of the, the deeply strange way in which publishing works. Mm. And that starts with the contract and it ends with the royalty statement. Mm, this is why you, you need an agent. This is why you need an agent. <laughs> yeah. Flying a flag for, <laughs> for, for agents. Yeah. Yeah. It's um uh, someone worked out that because of the fees that you get from public lending rights in the UK, you probably earn as much money from someone borrowing your book from yes. the library as you do from a Kindle. Yeah, it do, yeah, it probably does. It probably does. But it's a part. But there are there are other benefits. So when somebody buys a book, it's a, it's it's a, an advertisement for your book as much as anything else. If someone else sees them reading it um, in the library, the books that they get the most traffic are the ones that tend to be put at the front. There are there are lots of different lots of different ways to look at it. Now, all, a lot of our people with us on YouTube today, uh, Ink and Sage. I think I'd want enough of an advance to know that the publisher was serious about me and my work, but not so much that earning out becomes unlikely. But I've no idea what amount that is. It's, it's difficult. I mean, it depends what book you're writing. Yeah. Um, I mean, from from I mean, we as an agency. Um, have been going since the 1950s, and looking back through the through the 80s and 90s, even the even the early noughties, um, there are some ludicrous advances paid, mm. um, of which 95% was never recouped. Yeah. Um, and and I think that 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 doesn't help anybody. It demotivates the author. The publisher's got a whopping great black mark on their balance sheet. Um, I think somewhere sus somewhere sustainable and the area that, that, that I think publishers are kind of focusing on uh, uh, advances where you're offering somewhere between sort of five and twenty thousand pounds per book where you need to sell between five and twenty thousand copies mm -hmm. um, and I think you know is a really that's an oversimplification but what it what it is is a realistic target um, and once the book earns out then everybody's happy mm -hmm. the yeah. editor's happy yeah. you know increasingly editors are accountable for their own P&L so if they've got a great unearned advance hanging around their neck, it, they feel it as much as the author does. It's, um, it's something that we talk about a lot more as well. Mm -hmm. We'll have imprint reviews every quarter where each imprint will go through the books they've published mm -hmm. that have, have gone through their sort of life of hardcover and paperback. And there will be a review of the advance and the book sold and whether that book's in the red or in the black. Mm -hmm. And it's become a lot more transparent. And therefore, I think people are thinking a lot more about those advances and pitching them at a level where they will actually earn out. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a conversation going here about uh, Quiet Writer says, no indie bookshop in my area. I pester my co-workers to buy indie books for the library shelves. I'm a library clerk during the day. Robin says, there's a website, IndieBound, I think, which allows you to buy the book and attribute the sale to an indie store of your choice only in the US. Well, in the UK, there's the Hive, the Hive.co.uk. Mm. So you can order online from them and attribute the sale to your local, or you can have it delivered there and pick it up from there with free PMP. Mm. So there is that yeah. as well. And I, I think there is obviously it's good to support local independent bookstores. Um, I I think there is there's a lot of Amazon bashing. You know, Jeff Bezos is now the richest man 
ever. Yeah. He's not just the richest man in the world. He's the richest man ever. Yeah. Um, and and books are a book, books are a, a small part of of his empire and his it's, wealth. It's how they started. It's how they yeah. start. It's how they it's how they started. And I I remember an early talk about Amazon comparing it to the music industry and saying that when when Sean Fanning and Napster came along, he thought that all music should be free. When Jeff Bezos applied similar disruptive principles to books, he still thought people should pay for books. Mm. He just thought they should pay less for them and that they should buy them all from him, <laughs> which is, which, you know, he's a, he's, he's, a, he's a monopolist rather than an anarchist. Um, and um, I think that, that Amazon still serves a function. Um, yeah. I think, you know, they own Goodreads, they own eight books, um, and these are places to find books that you might not find through other channels. But if you have a local indie, then, you know. Yeah. Important. Yeah, no, definitely. And if you live in the sticks like me, it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And if you if you can't get out of the house, if if you've got uh, mobility issues, yeah. then again, it's fantastic. But you know, mix it up a bit. Don't get everything from Amazon. That's, that's exactly it. You know? yeah. And don't do it before Christmas. Christmas, you've got to go into a bookshop and you've got to look around because there'll be things that you would never yeah. even think of that Absolutely. will just leap out. Of you. Absolutely. Those yeah. those those gift tables are uh, you know. And and the thing that happens with Waterstones now as well, what those staff recommends publishers. Those, those are genuine staff recommends. Same goes for the indies as well. Mm. So, uh, yeah. So, look, um, special sales. Let's talk about another area, uh, which is special sales, which not a lot of people know about outside of publishing, which is certainly in the UK, if you go to school, mm. they hand around those book people catalogs yep. where you can buy the Mr. Men, all of the Mr. Men books in a box set or whatever mm. for what looks like and not a lot of money at all. Mm. And, um, and that also, uh, I don't think, I mean, the the deals for those they're a bit of a black art, aren't they? It's a, it's a, yeah. Special sales was always a, a category on contract as a way of dealing with non non traditional trade sales. So if if let's say a a, a garden centre wanted to stock some books. You couldn't hold them to your standard publisher terms because they had no idea how they worked. They didn't understand the kind of seller return middle, uh, principle. And so you came up with special sales, which was a firm sale. So mm. actually selling them the books. And for that, they would usually get it at a cheaper price. Mm. And as a result, the author would have to get a cheaper royalty on it, a lower royalty. Um, what happened is as it became clear that that was an avenue that more things could be lumped into, publishers have become a little cheeky in what they <laughs> what they attribute under special sales. And I think it, it has become a dark art. It's become a, a, a very skillful putting through books on a lower royalty than the author should be getting. I mean, the argument, again, playing devil's advocate, is, is that these reach offices and schools and church groups or whatever that, you know, the general market doesn't generally reach, although the internet's kind of made yeah, that a bit of a yeah. move. And I think, and, and particularly now you have Waterstones has started the program of shutting down stores, so places like The Works are the only bookshop in town. Mm. So if The Works is the only bookshop in town, then then they need to be considered a, a, a just a, a traditional retailer, mm. not a special sales company. Mm. Um, but I think a lot of this comes down to, to, to the ability or the inability of publishing to modernise. So the retail landscape changes, so the way in which books are sold as our published should change the, the, the way that they, they treat different types of sale. Um, and one thing that publishing is not very good at is, is changing. Um, it's, it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's an industry that, that, that has always, always been in a state of flux, but extremely slow flux. Um, everything is going to revolutionise it, and then nothing really does, whether it's the paperback, the, the CD-ROM, Ooh. The audio book, all of these things were heralded as the death of publishing. Um, and none of them have been. They've just become part of it. But fundamentally, the model on which publishing is run hasn't changed. Mm. And it should do. It should do, and it will do. And, you know, the Society of Authors, the ALCS, the Publishers Association all have different interests that they're kind of pulling. You've, you've mentioned the ALCS. Just for our listeners, can you clarify? So, uh, what is it? <laughs> what is it? The Artist Li Licensing and Collection Society. Yes. I yeah, think that. Yeah. It's basically secondary earnings. Um, so um, things like photocopying, uh, library photocopying, um, sort of non-traditional non uses of, uh, of, of book rights, um, university schools, things like that. Yeah. Um, and they're very good because they are, they are partly run by the British Library yeah. um, and it's all run out of the British Library. So it has a kind of charitable focus, but also they, they, they monitor, they pay out royalties um, mm -hmm. and often quite quite generous ones. If you're an academic, for example, and you've written a book that gets photocopied a lot in universities, then you'll yeah. you'll, you'll get a nice nice check from them once a year. I've registered with them, but I've never got 
any money from them. Uh, also, PLR. Uh, uh, do I mean PLR? Yes, yes public PLR, lending. Pu public lending, right. Yeah. Uh, if you're an author who's published, definitely sign up to that because that, that's where you get your, your library earnings from. Julian Barr says, the CD-ROM, I'll have to look that up on Encarta. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I loved Encarta. Oh, life was simpler then, wasn't it? We've got, we've got some questions uh, from Julian, actually. And it's kind of on to the next stage, which is if advances are falling, how else can authors make money? Uh, Julian says, we keep hearing about how authors need to adopt an entrepreneurial mindset and think of themselves as business owners as well as storytellers. What does that mean? I've been thinking about the idea of selling T-shirts with the illustrations for my books, as I think there's a market. It might be in a nice to have an alternate source of income. I mean, it's... Um, it's difficult. I think the idea you've always told me never to spend my own money. You know, I, I yeah. keep trying to do it and you keep stopping me. No, I, I, think it, I think it's good to be entrepreneurial. And I think, I think if you're... If if you're setting yourself up as an author, then you kind of have to be a cottage industry, um, and you, uh, you want a publisher there who is going to help. <laughs> oh God, my question! Um, um, <laughs> the, the, pub the publisher is going to help, and you're a team. Um, but at the same time, the more energy that the author brings to it, the more the publisher will will respond. Um, things like merchandising in different directions, t-shirts, mouse mats, yeah. is probably a bit of a distraction. But certainly promoting yourself using social media channels. Um, things that are free and it's just about increasing visibility. Um, I, it's all positive. I don't, the days when an author could just sort of hide in their ivory tower are gone. Mm -hmm. Now readers want to connect directly with that author. And the more connections you make, if you go to a convention, um, let's say, for example, you meet people. Uh, those people will buy your book and they're going to feel more of a connection to it than they would if they just, you know, read about it online. Yeah. Um, it's, it's part of it. And it's not, it's not the only thing. But it's definitely a thing. I am. Um, I mean, I make a point of going to comic cons whenever I'm invited, as long as I I know I can make my money back from mm. them. Uh, so MCM last few years, I've had a free table, which has been great because I've gone with another author I know called Kit Cox, uh, and I always make a bit of money on those. But I also get talking to people, and you know, you just generally mm. get you get them coming to your Twitter, to your Facebook, and what have you. Yeah. Um, I was at the RNA. Uh, conference, Romantic Novelist Association conference, a couple of weeks ago, and you get a goodie bag, and that was full of stuff, and it was what was effective and what wasn't. Um, most of it, I've got to be honest, you know, bookmarks or postcards. I mean, maybe it's because I'm not the target market, but it went into the recycling. Frankly, <laughs> there was one one person did uh, little coloured strips of post-it notes in like a match, you know, like a, a paper matchbox kind of yeah. thing for, and. That's brilliant. I'm using yeah. I'm using that to mark up my uh, my uh, documents, you know, and stuff mm. like that. So that was actually useful. But does um, that mean you're going to buy that book? Nope. And I think this is <laughs> this is and this is this is where the balance comes. Is it? It's it's all very well putting your name out there, but it, there has to be there has to be a, a, a sales benefit. It's got to be commercial. Um, otherwise, people will just you know use your post its yeah, <laughs> never do absolutely. it. So absolutely. don't so don't don't, don't don't go down the gimmicky route. Yeah. But at the same time, think of yourself as 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 a, a sales asset. So you're the best person to, to sell your book. If you do conventions, it might be worth investing in, in those uh, those things, those uh, displays that you pull up yeah. have the cover of your book yeah. behind you, and they're not that expensive either. Yeah. I forgot what they're called, but I'll try and find a and if, and if And if you work with a publisher, and the publisher will have a, a, a marketing, a publicity budget that, that's allocated to you, if you haven't been demanding at all, then go and talk to them and say, look, how about you throw some assets at me? Help me out. Yeah, um, some bookmarks or postcards or something anything you can like hand that. out. Book or, plates, yeah, yeah. you know, the whole the whole shebang. Things that are that are that are cheap and easy and effective, and get a message across that 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 you're taking it seriously, you're thinking strategically, um, and that that the, the publisher needs to respond in kind. Uh, Incan Sage has a question. If agents only, or mostly, earn from the author's advances, do they get any benefit from representing indie authors who don't have advances? Would there be any point? So. Indie authors, as in as in self-published authors. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, usually, the point at which an indie author would get an agent is if they want to they want to have their book sold to a to a publisher. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's a generalisation. Sometimes they will take an agent on for uh, for foreign rights or for film rights, something like that. In which case, there's an alternate revenue stream. Um, on the, I mean, sometimes we find that digital publishers don't offer an advance. In which case, the agent will take their percentage on, on royalties. So that'd be something yeah. like Booker Chaw, maybe. Booker Chaw, um, Canelo, who are my current favourite indie publisher, who are a very good digital publisher. Um, um, there's a couple more. 
there's a, there, there are new publishers starting up all the time, but um, but the, the 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 advanced model only only works if if the, the if the company has enough capital to be able to outlay it. Essentially, the publisher shoulders the risk. Um, so if you if you don't have that seed capital, if you're starting up in your bedroom, then you can say we'll give you a generous royalty, um, but we won't be able to stump anything up up front. And particularly if it's a backlist. Um, or republishing things, then that can be much better. I've got a lovely old lady. If anyone likes romance novels, really like old school romance, a splendid old Welsh granny called Grace Thompson. Um, and she was published by a publisher called Robert Hale, who went bust mm -hmm. a couple of years ago at work. Um, and, so, uh, and so we took all of her rights when they went bust and we gave them to Canelo. Um, and a, a lady whose cumulative earnings for the previous decade had been about £57 was suddenly getting cheques for, for, I mean, proper money. Um, and she's 85. She had no idea what to do with it. She, <laughs> she said she bought she bought her grandchildren each a car, and Whoa. she and she and she'd upgraded Rosie her dog onto the posh dog food, and, and that was it. She had no idea. So you know there are there are huge benefits from from sometimes foregoing an advance and and taking better royalty. So I like book because most publishers will pay what three times a year, uh, twice a year, twice a year. Okay, yeah. so. Uh, Bookature, do they uh, and uh, do these digital publishers pay more often? Because if you're an indie, if you're with uh, uh, KDP, yeah. you get money every month, yeah, which is quite appealing. Which is quite, which is quite nice. And KDP, the royalty is seventy percent, but you have to do all the work. Yes. Uh, whereas, <laughs> whereas a digital publisher is a full service publisher, um, and, uh, and 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 I think they do quarterly. Right. Head of Zeus, when they set up, they started off quarterly and realised it was unsustainable. Um, essentially, the, the pub publishers have to maintain their cash flow. That's the problem. Uh, they're investing money in production, in design, in all these different things. And if they're having to pay out regularly, then their cash flow is completely done. So um, so not only uh, publishers giving a small percentage, they're only paying out twice a year. No. Yeah. Oh, no, but they're not just paying out twice a year. <laughs> they're, paying, they're paying out twice a year three months late uh, because <laughs> traditionally you would have to collect the monies physically, whereas now the money gets wired into their accounts digitally, but right. they still make us wait for for three months. And again, this is this is all part of it. This publishing model is 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 a is a, a model that has never really been modernised. And the, the problem is that you can't update all of it because agents and authors want to keep some of it. Mm. Um, and then there are other bits that they want to get rid of. But if we say, let's get rid of that bit, then the publisher says, but no, no, but we'll have to get rid of that bit too. Yeah. Um, and so you end up getting nowhere. Um, which is, you know, which is which is how we've got here. But new publishers are the key, fresh blood. So as as big publishers merge and buy up different publishers, new ones start up who come in with fresh thinking, mm. who have a more kind of disruptive idea, and that's 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 progress. Yes. Uh, Incan says, brilliant, thanks, and good on the lovely Welsh granny. <laughs> Grace, Grace Thompson, it's wonderful. All her books are essentially the same. They're all brilliant. Actually, she's, a good she's a good story. She was my predecessor's 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 author. Um, and she signed up two writers. One was writing Welsh sagas. One was writing Irish sagas. The Irish saga writer was Maeve Binchy. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. And because of, the America, because of the Irish diaspora in America, Maeve Binchy obviously went stratospheric. And Grace, who's writing Welsh sagas, there's no real Welsh diaspora. Apart from Patagonia, right, um, yes. and so the books just trundled trund along until now. And now Grace is up there. R Richie says traditional publishing does seem pretty broken. Well, it's not because they're making money. Yeah, they are making. They're money. making. Money. And if you get the right publisher and the right book, you are off to the races, really, yeah. aren't you? I mean, yeah. if you get it right. But it's there is so much more choice now. That that route of going, okay, I'm going to get an agent. I'm going to get a publisher. I'm going to be in W. H. Smiths. That's no longer the only route to no, publication. It's not. It's not. And it's and publishing is has got a lot more competition now. I mean, it's it's competing for eyeballs. Is the mm. is the horrible marketing phrase for it? But you know, in the in, back, back in days of yore, it was it was books on books on nothing. Ah, yore. I, mean, then, I loved yore. Yore. <laughs> <laughs> yore was the best. Whereas now, now it, it, publishing is is it's not even just competing against other other like print material. It's 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 Netflix. I mean, we had YouTube. we had Steve Kavanagh on the show a few weeks ago, um, and he's a thriller writer, and he's written you know three, four cracking books so far. But the book that's come out this year, thirteen, we were like, this is his best book. This is the breakthrough book. And since he came on the show, and I'm attributing his success completely to his appearing on the podcast, <clears throat> um, the sales have gone through the roof, yeah. absolutely through the stratosphere. Fantastic reviews. 
And, you know, he's someone who's gone through that. He, you know, he could, you know, have gone the Mark Dawson or Mark Edwards route, but mm. he's he's gone through that route and a publisher stuck by him. And now he's quitting. Yeah, he's having a, a great time. Uh, you well, know, so it does work. It really it does. does. And work. you think of in, in all in all spheres, all genres. So Hilary Mantel. Ian McEwan. These are not writers who are breakout successes with their first books. The mm. idea that, that 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 your first book should be your best book is ludicrous. In no other creative endeavour is there an expectation that you come out of the blocks and sell a million copies. I mean, it, it's it's it, writing is something that develops, and each book should be better. And at some point, if you have a publisher who believes in you, and if you believe in yourself, and you have the support from your friend, from your family, it's hugely important to have that. Then then you will write the book that is going to break you out. And I really do believe that. So anyone who starts a podcast telling people that their first book should be a bestseller would be a misguided fool. I would say <laughs> it's a <laughs> dereliction of duty. Um, but it's but but equally, I think that I think that when things come out of the blocks fast, then it's then it's fabulous. It's really exciting. You know, that can be the start of a, of a of a of a brilliant career. But I think the expectation that it should be is one that we need to dispense with. Yeah. You know, publishing loves a debut because it's you, it's a it's a clean slate. Um, you can talk about you can talk about anything, um, but I think it's it's all about building careers. And as an as an agency, we've always we've always done that. You know, we looked after Dick Francis for his whole career. Uh, Beryl Bainbridge, um, William Trevor went away and came back to us because he missed us. <laughs> you know, it's it's and with these authors, you build over time, um, and you end up with with people who can live off their writing. And that's got to be the key. Richie says, I think my point was most trad pub authors are living on less than minimum wage, but everyone in and around trad publishing is doing nicely on a normal salary. Well, I mean, it's you're not really comparing like for like, though, are you? I mean, it's uh, I work here on, uh, as a nine to five job, you know. Uh, it's not a creative. What I do isn't creative. It, it, no. There's no risk attached to it in the way that a creative job has risk attached no, to it. No, and I think that I think that as a as a writer, you have other options so writing you can treat as a nine-to-five job and some people do and that's wonderful um the majority of new writers i take on will be doing it before after at weekends um fitting it around another job and then over time the balance will shift um i think if you if you start from scratch and expect to live just off your writing mm. and it's gonna be bloody tough and again you don't get into publishing for the money either. no no what is it how's it what's the, the old joke is uh, it's it's mm. how to make a small fortune out of publishing it's start with a large <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe I believe that was a, that was a punch cartoon in, in sort of in the late 19th century it's still it's still, true. still true it really is <laughs> half of Anthony Cheetah that we can't talk about <laughs> <laughs> oh god no I can't um, uh, Richie your says agent. Ah. <laughs> no, don't don't I have holes in my socks honestly Awful. But no, I do. It's you know, I've been an agent for twelve years, and and essentially, you're 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 losing money for your employer for the first four or five because mm -hmm. because you have to you have to you have to put the time in, yeah. um, and a lot of it is is on is is just those. It's continuing to do it and believing in writers and believing in the people that you take on and and helping them to get better. And that's kind of that's it. There is some skill involved. Yeah. I like to think. No, there is. I mean, it helps to have people who are good at writing. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'll let you know if I find anyone. Uh, Richie says, if a book doesn't fly, who's at fault? The author who doesn't get picked up or the trad publisher? I mean, that's that's the million dollar question. The book doesn't fly in the sense of if it doesn't if it doesn't get picked up or yeah. if it doesn't if it doesn't get picked up by a publisher, the, I guess. Yeah. Nobody ever talks about the one thing in publishing. The one thing that actually defines what makes a super duper mega bestseller or a book that does nothing, and that's luck, mm. luck, luck, luck. It's just it. Th there are there are imponderables. It's a creative endeavor. So people can say this book is going to work because of X, Y, and Z. The re oh, <laughs> so man, so so Incan says, is right, Mr. Wilson. Says my first book is making money. I promise to send you some socks. Oh, He's thanks. fine for socks. Thanks. Don't worry about that. No, I'm not. I go through some like clarification no from Richie. I mean, if it doesn't make its money back, so if it doesn't earn out. Well, I mean, no, but luck, luck is involved at the earlier stage. So there are plenty of authors who don't find an agent because they don't send it to the right person on the right day. Mm. When they get taken on, there are plenty of brilliant, brilliant books that don't land with a publisher. And it's not because they're not good enough. It's because they just don't, they just don't quite, right, they just don't get the luck. They don't have the right yeah. run. And I think authors, there are lucky authors and there are unlucky authors. Um, and I think that if you keep on doing, if you're perseverant, and if you don't beat yourself up about it, um, you know, sometimes brilliant books don't sell. 
That's the reality. Mm. Um, and it's not because the it's not because the publishing world is against you. Um, it's because it's because you've been unlucky and you've just got to keep on writing. If you're a writer, then keep on writing and uh, keep believing in yourself and, 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 and you will prevail. Um, and, you know, not to the point of madness. If there's 150 books you've written and none of them have landed, then maybe maybe that's not going to happen for you. But don't do it once and then give up because you haven't. Because if you are a writer, then then you have to do it. It's a it's a creative need. Well, we've I mean, every single author we've spoken to on here has told us the same story, which is rejection, 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 yeah. rejection, rejection, rejection. Oh, bit of luck. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is it's just kind of how it works. So if advances are falling and you know, you're getting less money than ever. How can authors make money? I mean, the uh, sales aren't the only way an author makes money. There are rights as well. You mentioned rights earlier. Yeah. yeah. So when you sell, a, uh, when an agent sells a book to a publisher, you will either sell world rights, which includes translation, um, or world English, which is um, around the world in the English language, so American rights as well, um, or just UK and Commonwealth. Um, which again, a bit of an imperial hangover. If you use, if you were once in the British Empire, then we can still sell books to you. And that's the and that's the vibe. Uh, it's you don't think, and you look at the Commonwealth countries, and you think this isn't the Commonwealth. This is the Empire. Yes, in the pink still. All the pink bits. Yeah. So, um, um, but rights is an important side, and if you the German book market, they still have a level of price fixing in the German book market, so that sustains. The uh, <laughs> sorry, Julian's just gone. Yay, Commonwealth nation! Because <laughs> uh, you're in we, South Africa, aren't you? England, yeah, yeah. we love the Commonwealth, yeah. but it's you know, it's there's some bits in the Middle East that I'm pretty sure aren't Commonwealth countries, but we, yeah, we don't we like to talk about that. Yeah, that. The sewers, the, uh, the, <laughs> so the right is really important. The German book market's as big, if not slightly bigger, than the UK mm. one, America as well. Um, Americans don't discount as heavily as we do, so there, there tends to be more money flowing around. Um, but, you know, even little ones, selling a book to Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, um, you know, these are, they all, it all adds up and it just it, it, it helps you, to, helps you to, to, to live off these kind of little bits of money coming in. I remember mean, getting very excited when someone in the rights department here came and told me that Robert Overlord was big in Singapore. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> but which edition was it? Because Singapore, you get UK and US editions like side by side of the book. Oh. Dun, dun, dun. I haven't seen any money from it. No, so. <laughs> but you will. Do, but you will do. And then um, uh, film and TV. I don't like to mention it because authors get excited about film and TV. Yeah. But again, the idea is if you've got, let's say, four or five books that are all in print in the UK, the US, Germany, and a couple of other countries, you get the odd bit of TV money coming in, then you're starting to build a sustainable career. Mm. But, you know, that takes you time. That can take a decade. Mm. And that's the aim. So when I take an author on, by 10 years from that date, the hope is that they will then have a sustainable career. Mm. Uh, that doesn't mean they have to give up their jobs. Um, some want to. Yeah. Some don't. I mean, what I'm, what I'm seeing online is there are some authors who went through that golden age of big advances, mm. now seeing their advances shrink, yeah. and they're now saying, I'm going to have to go back to work. Yeah. You know, yeah. which is... A big reality check for yeah, people. Yeah, it? which is, and that's the so-called mid list. The idea that you're not small, and you're not 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 uh, with a small publisher and getting attention from them. You're not with a big publisher and a front list writer, so getting all the resources. That you're sort of just chugging along in the middle somewhere, um, and it's it's difficult. But if that's what you're doing and you're, and you're not happy with it, then write something different. You know, yeah. I'm a big believer that if you're a writer and you have those skills. You can't. You, 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 most writers are not just one trick ponies. No. And if Mr. D were here, I know in the past he's mm. spoken about streams of income, and he's the master of this. Mm. Where you don't rely on one big chunk of income coming in, you get different streams of income, which which give you little buffers. So, yeah. you know, you could give talks. Uh, when I went to the RNA, I got a bit of money for that. Not a lot. It basically covered my rail fare and travel, frankly. But I got a bit of money for that. Um, consultancy. If you think you have a skill that you can apply if you're good at proofreading or copywriting or, or something like that offer that you know mm -hmm. a couple of hundred quid here and there starts to add up. it yeah. takes you away from the writing but if you don't want to go back to the monolithic salary yeah. way of living then that's where and, and of course things like patreon you can offer something on patreon or ko-fi ask for people on ko-fi yes i like ko-fi yeah. that's that i mean it's, it's, it's these are there are all ways that people who want to support Artists, creative people can can do it. I mean, there are plenty of avenues, and I think there's nothing wrong with having different 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 ways of making your money. I mean, the idea of the traditional sort of linear career where you work in the same office, I think, is kind of 
kind of gone now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would be nice, wouldn't it? It's yeah. just at the home. But, <laughs> but, you know, just as an, as an agent, I don't rely on one author. If I relied on one author to provide most of my income, then then the day that author stops selling, I'd be I'd be done. If it was me, you'd be destitute, mate. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what were we saying here? Uh, it looks like you are going to get some socks. Robin Sarty said, make sure the socks are rightly. Very small feet, just, just my feet are size. <laughs> A size seven. So don't get don't get don't get great giant ones. Uh, <laughs> Julian says the dream, of course, is to sell the movie TV rights. It, it it never gets made. The rights yeah. automatically revert to the author who sells them again. Uh, I can say that I've had of all the auctions I've done, I've probably done. I mean, quite a few film and TV auctions over the years. I've seen one made. A total disaster. <laughs> total disaster. <laughs> I mean, like I'm not going to say who it is, but it was awful. Um, and uh, and um, and and in fact, the other ones, it's kind of free money. You know, you want to make sure sure that the checks and balances are there but you take the money two years past two years past sometimes they renew so you take that money too nothing happens then as you say the rights come back yeah well um, then we had richard morgan on the show and the whole story of how altered carbon which was mm. published in 2002 2003 joel silver initially yeah. you know optioned it kept re option kept 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 and then it elapsed and then netflix picked it up and now it's the biggest yeah. show on, yeah. on netflix and, that's, yeah. and if you can do that I and mean, it's all part of the way that the, the the whole the whole film and tv world is changing so now you have netflix you have amazon uh, you've got apple tv is starting their own studio yes. up so you've got lots of new people and they're desperate for content so it's a it's a more fertile time but it's it's moving tv isn't the thing writing the books is the thing i remember there was the um the jack reacher conversation at harrogate a few years ago so somebody said to um, to Lee Child, uh, "How do you feel about the fact that Tom Cruise has bought the rights to your book and 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 ruined it?" And um, <laughs> Lee, <laughs> Lee, 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 Lee Child, he's a pretty robust fellow, um, held up one of his books and he said, "Last time I checked, the words in here were the same." Yeah, and he's and in that's the film it. as well. And that's it. If you if you if you as long as you don't invest too emotionally too much in it, then then they can do what they want because the job is writing a book. And, and nobody touches that. And that's why people love writing books. Mm. Because once it's done, it's done. Yeah. Anyone can come to it, whereas the film will just disappear. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> no, no. Yes. Apart from um, quality films like Robert Overlord. Yeah, that, no, it's that, that persist. <laughs> that, that, that persist. Uh, it's now on Amazon Prime, actually. Is it? It's Amazon Prime, yeah. Is and it? it's weird. I can watch ever, it. I haven't ever, watched it. Ever yet. since it's gone on Amazon Prime, uh, the number of visits to my blog, because I have a page all about the DVD, mm -hmm. where you can buy the DVD and the Blu-ray, have gone through the roof. It's really interesting, actually. Well, that's my that's that's my night sorted. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's the proper, because when it first came out on Blu-ray, it's been fixed now, but when it, it what they full screened it, mm. John was furious. Because it's it's shot in Panavision, so it's okay. proper proper old lenses. Mm. And it looks fantastic. It was really really good, and they full screened it. John was livid. What? So you but, lost the edges? Yeah, <sighs> lost the yeah yeah. It's, um, anyway, uh, Incan says there was a South African actress comedian some time back who said, when asked how she chose her gig, said, "If they offer you three fifty rand, that rand, that yeah. must be rand, and a hot dog, you say yes." It seems like the same applies for writers. And she's going to make note of your small feet and supply appropriately. Why is he getting free socks? He's on one episode. Dude, Agents, look honestly, at look at me. I have young children. <laughs> and it's, I don't have time to darn my socks, but thank you. That's very kind. That's very kind of you. But no, in, ge in general, I think. The idea that writers should be paid for doing events is 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 hugely important. I mean, you look at you look at how, what Hay Festival used to give people like a bottle of wine, yeah. and they and it's a it's a it's a it's an international operation. They make money. They make money, mm -hmm. and if they're making money, then you as the as the as the talent should make money too. Yeah. Yeah, R Richie says Robert Overlaws. The book was better. I can possibly comment. <laughs> um, a lot of people work very hard on that. Film, yeah. So yes, yes, I'm, I can possibly comment. Um, <clears throat> Should, now, this will kick off with the Society of Authors, who uh, in the UK are essentially our uh, mark will send you seven and a half percent of a pair of socks. Thank you very much, <laughs> <laughs> Robin. <laughs> um, Society of Authors is essentially the, an authors' union in the UK. Yes. Should an author consider joining the SOA? The SOA is 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 a good thing. And I would say that, that without without qualification, um, I think that the, the, what they do, they champion authors' rights. They've got a very passionate head. Uh, Nicola Solomon is an ex lawyer from Penguin, and she's brilliant. She knows her stuff, and she's great. Um, I think there are there are some issues around 
what they do with unagented authors. So they they act as a literary agent in effect. Some of them because they look at a contract. Yeah, they'll, they'll go over. They'll do a contract yeah. check for you. And I think to a certain extent, what they do there is perhaps slightly competing with the people they're meant to be helping. Um, which is problematic, but as, as a, the SOA, I'd say, is is is, is a holy cause. I know my aunt, Marion Denty, whose books are available on Amazon now. Um, she, I know, she had a contract with uh, Paul Beg in Ireland for her first book, mm. and the SOA looked at that for her. And yeah. She actually got a pretty good deal. Yeah, yeah, and that's and they can and they can help you out if you don't have an agent. Then join the SOA, and they will they will help you out. But don't think that join the the SOA is instead of getting an agent. Yes, because it's not. And whatever you do, don't join the SAS. No, uh, or I the did, SBS. Or the SBS. I tried that and lasted just you know seven hours. No, <clears> that's that's a different story. <laughs> um, we've got about ten minutes left. It's flown by, isn't it? Uh, well, we say that our listeners. Yeah, that's, that's it. They're they're all, they're all, they're all, they're all, well, I think they're having. They appear to be drinking under the palm tree somewhere. With them. Good luck. Yeah. Not a not a thing. Not even water did Mark offer me for this. I was thinking a cool gin and tonic. Oh. I thought maybe. <laughs> A strawberry daiquiri. I'm not supposed to give anything to agents. You're <laughs> supposed to be buying me drinks and buying me lunch, which I've had for a while, I might add. <clears throat> Here's a question. Now, I had, I had lunch with my cousin today who's finished uh, his novel and he's sending it out to agents. And he got his first reje- rejection. So congratulations, Chris. Badge of honour. He did ask an interesting question, which I didn't have an answer for, which is have slush pile submissions fallen since the big indie publishing, self-publishing boom? No, no. They've gone through the roof. Through <laughs> the roof. Um, I'm getting up to 100 a week at the moment. Um, oh. And it's, it's, it's partly it's because of the internet, because it's easier to finish a Word document, attach it, um, and, um, and, and send it up before. At least an author would have to find a printer get some paper, print it out, get the postage, put it together. But it, it's, um, I think people try indie publishing and they realise that that, it, that it, it, it can be a way of making money, but more often than not, it isn't. Yeah. You know, with the one thing about traditional publishing is no, the, the author shouldn't lose money. They'll, they'll, they'll lose their time and possibly their self-respect. <laughs> um, but uh, no, that's not a serious comment. Um, uh, but they should lose money, whereas I think something like 20% of self-published authors actually lose money um, because you have to invest in the cover design and all the different things well, this that, is, this that Amazon will sell you. So no, indie publishing, quite often we find people have put books up on KDP and have not enjoyed the process and they want to go through the right route. Mm. It's interesting because I've missed a question that Robin uh, posted earlier. He said, for indie authors, the general idea is just to keep writing more and marketing more as much as possible. But in a more traditional publishing model, what things should an author do? It would be the publisher's role to pay for advertising, etc. And that's absolutely right. Yes, should it not be outlaying any money? No, you really shouldn't. Uh, but I think the general idea that indie authors should be writing quicker than, 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 than other authors, if you can write quick, then write quick. And if, you, and, if you, and if it takes you a year, if it takes you two years, then it takes you two years. There's no right and wrong. Um, bits of the market are much more about volume. So if you're a crime writer, you're writing a series, then the faster you can churn them out, the better. That's and that's what, true for a publisher. Yeah, it's, it's what Mark Dawson said. He was he could write them faster than, than his publisher yeah, published yeah. them. I, exactly. Who I mentioned before, he uh, he. By the time he signed a three book contract, he already had five books written. Um, and that's just because some people do it. And it's important to remember that that when the words are flowing, you've got to take advantage of it because there will be times when the words aren't flowing. Yeah. Um, and the more that you are that you take advantage of those fertile periods of creativity, the better you'll be able to weather the, the you know, the, the lulls that every, that every author has. Yeah, and Richie says, crime, romance, thriller seems to be about quick, quick, quick. Yeah. I mean, they, those are markets that hoover up books. Probably, I mean, that, probably, yeah. You want to get to the end of the, of the e-book. I mean... It's not a coincidence. Those are genres that sell well in ebook. You want to get to the end of the book and immediately click through to the next. And you either do that by delaying first publication. So um, my colleague Anna Power looks after a writer called um, what she, uh, she's called Cara Hunter, um, and her first book, Close to Home, was a Rich and Judy pick. Um, has sold something like three hundred thousand copies in ebook. Wow. Uh, Best selling debut ebook in the whole of PRH's history. Wow, <laughs> really? Um, and um, and uh, for her, they delayed publication so that they could publish three books in rapid succession. Um, and that's increasingly what publishers like to sort of generate momentum that way. And it's interesting because Joe Abercrombie, uh, Gallants have a trilogy coming from him. 
and I know he has held off from publication because he wants the trilogy complete. Mm. That's not to say it'll be coming out one after the other every fortnight, but he, he wanted to get to the end so that he knew that you know he didn't yeah. he didn't get to book three and think, oh god, I wish I'd rewritten book one kind well, of thing. To a certain extent, I mean, like he's in the position of being able to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if it's a, if it's if it's working, then then the publishers say, oh. How about the next one? Um, but it's not quite that easy. Yeah. Authors are not machines. You don't press a red button and the book churns out. No. Uh, I'm I'm a human, you know. <laughs> I have <a> needs. <laughs> um, in Consages, it comes down, I think we're back onto socks. It comes down to ask and you shall receive, Mr. Stay. You didn't ask or even mention. No, but I have had chocolate hobnobs come in the post. Uh, from listeners. Now you have to stop that because I'm off the sugar. I'm trying to quit what? the sugar. Yeah, I'm trying to come what? off the sugar. Well, I, set would... my, I set my backside out there. Why would you? Just... Why would you do that? I get sent <laughs> some very weird stuff. I get. I've been sent bottles of wine, chocolates, um, an oven glove. You know about the oven glove? This was a submission where the um, where the book was too hot to handle. Oh my god! So it was sent with an oven glove. And um, yeah, it was. I, I we worked out who they sent it to because we were all on Twitter. And then I went. <laughs> someone sent me an oven glove. This is madness. Um, the the weirdest one though is quite recently I got this package was left at my building's reception and it contained a mug with a cat on it, a cat pencil, uh, some cake in a mug sachets and a photograph of someone's cat with the words, who else? And that's it. Nothing. No submission, Don't no name. name. Nothing. I've no idea who it was from. Don't do this, people. This Please. is not that. No. <laughs> Please. So Richie says of me, no booze or sugar. Yeah. Well, I, I have a bit of sugar occasionally, but honestly, where I sit, they pile up all the, If someone comes back from holiday, they come back with all these snacks, and they all sit right next to my dad, and I was just constantly grazing. So working hours, I'm uh, I'm off the sugar. It's no way to live your life. Well, it might make me live a little <laughs> bit longer. <laughs> I've lost some weight, so that's helping. Right, we've got about three minutes left. So, um, this is whizzed by. It has whizzed by, absolutely whizzed by. So basically, um, it's it's hang in there, isn't it? That's it's hang in there. Yeah. It's, you're, you're not going to be, I mean, there, there are the outliers who do get those massive advances, uh, and you do hear about them in the news and yeah. in, the, in the bookseller, but for 99.9% .9 of us, uh, it is about getting down and, yeah. and... And it's true, and it's no different to any other creative industry. It's... Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, you know, I worked hard for five years to be an overnight sensation. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you have to keep on going, you have to persevere. And the long term goal is always to live off your writing. But some people won't get there, some people choose not to. Um, and I don't think there's a right or wrong. If you play the piano, you're not expecting to just live off that. You enjoy it, you enjoy the process. Um, and I think for some reason, writing has become incredibly competitive. Whereas if you enjoy writing, then that should be enough. Mm. And anything else is a bonus. Yeah, we're not in competition with each other. No. Mind you, Ed's, uh, uh, Richie says, also, Ed, are you accepting submissions? <gasps> yeah, of course I'm accepting submissions. Um, if you have a look, so we're called Johnson and Alcock. Johnson and Alcock. Yeah, we didn't um, even mention that, did we? No, no, yes. I didn't do my little bio, I did my sales pitch. Um, but no, Johnson and Alcock, um, have a look on our website. You'll see a, a, a list of what I'm after. Um, and if you would love to send me a book, then mention that you saw me on here, and I'll try and prioritise. Now, Lincoln Sage says, I lost the stream completely. Oh, no. Sorry. Sorry, no, Lincoln Sage. come back. Um, but it'll all be on the podcast. So uh, this will be live in a couple of weeks. Mm. Uh, and if you listen to the podcast, it's live now. How does that work? That's really weird. Mm. Um, but yes, uh, thank you, everyone, thank for coming today much. and for your questions. Uh, and that, that was... Uh, that is one of the that's all that qualifies as a deep dive we do these deep dives on, yeah. on patreon for our patreon supporters we've got more of those coming soon uh julian barr's been fantastic with that he's uh, he's come up some uh do stay tuned for those please subscribe rate and review uh the podcast on itunes thanks to dave our editor who is amazing as always buy our book back to reality there you go send us some money if you haven't already or, or review the book if you've read and enjoyed it it's much much appreciated uh come and find us on social media we are best seller experiment on first first facebook and uh, facebook the uh best seller experiment i don't know what accent that is it's probably racist uh twitter and instagram we are at best seller xp and we have pretty pictures on pinterest i think we need to stop there julian says wait you guys wrote a book yes we did <laughs>
<laughs> it's all on the podcast. I need to stop now. I need to catch a train. Um, thank you, folks. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been fun. And Ed, thank you, Ed. This is late, and you've you've you know you've, late. I've got your babysitting duty you've, tonight. You've, 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 <laughs> uh, missed, my, my, missed the portion of the day where the children scream consistently for forty-five minutes. So thank you, man. It's very nice, uh, nice to meet you all. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, folks. Thank and until next time, happy writing. Bye. Bye.